It's August 16th here in Seoul, and I'm Kim Dami. We begin with these stories making the headlines at this hour. Starting with a new vision for unification proposed by President Yoon suk yeol In light of Liberation Day on Thursday, the South Korean leader announced a vision for the unification of South and North Korea based on freedom and democracy. The new doctrine includes a proposal to reignite a dialogue between the two Koreas. Ukraine continues to talk up its advances into Russia, even setting up a military office there. Russia insists it has taken back part of the territory. With the blistering summer heat continuing to trap the entire nation, Seoul City has now gone through 26 straight tropical nights, equally a record seen six years ago. Busan City has had 22 tropical nights in a row. Marking National Liberation Day, President Yoon suk has set out a new roadmap for the unification of South and North Korea, based on expanding freedom and democracy for North Korean citizens. Our Oh Seung leads us this morning. President Yoon suk has proposed reopening dialogue between South and North Korea as he laid out a new doctrine for unification based on freedom and democracy. This came on Thursday as Yoon made a speech to mark 79 years since Koreans gained liberation when Imperial Japan surrendered to allied countries, bringing an end to World War II. Addressing not only 51 million South Koreans, but also 26 million Koreans in the North, Yoon envisioned a unified Republic of Korea, deeming unification as the ultimate stage of liberation. <laughs> Yun declared his three-point vision based on a free and democratic order under the South Korean Constitution. 국민의 자유와 안전이 보장되는 행복한 나라. 창의와 혁신으로 도약하는 강하고 풍요로운 나라, 국제 사회의 화합과 발전을 선도하며 세계 평화와 번영에 기여하는 나라, 이것이 바로 통일 대한민국의 미래입니다. Bridging the economic, social, and cultural divide between the South and North since the Korean War, Yoon stressed the need to reinforce values and capacity to pursue unification. In doing so, the president set out seven action plans, beginning with engaging South Korean citizens, particularly young people, with educational programs on unification amid waning public interest and support for unification in recent years. The administration aims to inspire North Koreans to desire unification, focusing on their freedom and individual rights. Seoul will ramp up efforts to improve North Koreans' human rights situation by working with domestic and international bodies and by creating a special fund to promote the cause. The South also plans to expand the variety of information that reach North Korean residents to help them learn about the outside world. Humanitarian aid is another area of focus to ensure North Korean survival from natural disasters and calamities and to support vulnerable social groups. Yun once again highlighted the role of North Korean defectors in facilitating unification based on their own experiences and integration into a free society. Most significantly, Yun proposed a new dialogue channel between the two Koreas. The working group would cover any and all issues not limited to people-to-people -to -people exchanges, economic cooperation, disaster relief and humanitarian aid, on top of denuclearization and military affairs. However, Seoul and Pyongyang's ties have worsened in recent years, as North Korea continues to pose a nuclear threat to the region and has cut off official communication channels with the South. Humanitarian aid to North Korea and the inter-Korean dialogue body require a response from the North Korean authorities. We will wait for that response. Even if it does not come immediately, we can plan and pursue the remaining five unification action plans independently. Unification is a task that requires patience and sustained effort, even if it takes time.
Imagining a unified South and North that contributes to global peace and prosperity, the UN administration says it will engage the international community in dialogue and gain support as it works towards a unified Republic of Korea. Wu Xiang, Arirang News. And in honor of National Liberation Day, the National Museum of Korea is displaying special artifacts to remember those who sacrificed their lives for the nation's independence. Our EUNI has this report. South Korea celebrates National Liberation Day on August 15th, the day Korea regained independence from Japan in 1945 after 35 years of colonization. This day honors the sacrifices of countless individuals who fought for freedom. This year, the National Museum of Korea is running a special exhibition on the independence movement, focusing on the work of activist Na Seok Ju. This exhibition is meaningful because it features letters from activist Na Seok Ju, which are being displayed for the first time. Independence activist Da Seok Ju's letters detail his plan, which involved bombing institutions that were exploiting Joseon's resources and ultimately ending his own life. Though less known than some other Korean activists, the detailed letters reveal his dedication and efforts to expose the injustices of his time. It's just the story of wanting peace and wanting to be free and to do, you know, what he did to sacrifice his life for um, what he felt was freedom for the country and so just really fascinating to read the details and to learn a little bit more about all the history. So. He threw bombs. Na Sukju was a remarkable activist. Another special display honors the 79th anniversary of National Liberation Day. The Korean national flag is called the Taegukki and this is the oldest remaining example dating back to at least 1891. King Gojong presented the flag to his American diplomatic advisor, Owen Denny, and it is thus known as Denny's Taegukki. Just the evolution of the design and um, the colors, and I like how with the harmony and bringing in the yin and yang and then the different elements of the earth and just to represent the country is really um, unique in my perspective. The special displays of activist Da Sokju's documents and the Taegukki will be on view until October 9th. Alongside the special displays, the National Museum of Korea's permanent collection features artifacts from the Joseon dynasty, so be sure to explore them. Curator Yu se said she hopes the exhibition will help people reflect on the meaning of liberation. Lee Eun-hee, Arirang News. Ukraine continued its incursion into Russia's Kursk region for the 10th day, with both sides engaging in fierce clashes. While Russia claims that they have recaptured some of the villages taken over by Ukraine, Kiev says otherwise, saying they are continuing to advance into Russia. Lee seung has more. As Ukraine's offensive in Russia's Kursk region moved into its 10th day on Thursday, Russia says it has taken back some of the villages initially captured by the Ukrainian military. However, Kyiv says its military has been continuing to advance further into the region, adding that a military command and control center was even set up in Kursk. Ukraine's top military commander also added that the troops had advanced up to 1.5 kilometers over the previous 24 hours and has seized 82 villages and 1,150 square kilometers of territory so far. Meanwhile, Russia has declared a state of emergency in the border region of Belgorod following attacks by Ukrainian forces. The decision comes as Ukraine has conducted daily attacks in Belgorod and nearby regions. Meanwhile, according to the Wall Street Journal on Thursday, Ukraine was behind the Nord Stream pipeline explosion in 2022. The report says that a small crew of six Ukrainian soldiers and divers were behind the sabotage. The report further alleges that the operation was planned out during a drunken night in May 2022 and was initially approved by Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. However, after the CIA found out about the plan, Kyiv was told to stop. Despite that call, then Ukraine's Armed Forces Commander-in-Chief went ahead with the operation. Ukraine has denied the report by the Wall Street Journal and instead continued to insist that Russia was behind the sabotage, adding that only Moscow can carry it out with such extensive technical and financial resources. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. 
Gaza ceasefire negotiations resumed on Thursday amid growing concerns over the conflict escalating. According to Reuters, the ceasefire talks are resumed in Doha, with the U.S., Egypt, Qatar and Israeli delegation taking part, but Hamas did not take part in the discussions. White House and National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby said that while the resumption of talks is a good starting point, there are obstacles to overcome. Meanwhile, Gaza's health ministry announced on Thursday that over 40,000 Palestinians have been killed since October 7 last year, while over 92,000 others have been injured. The annual inflation rate in the U.S. slowed to 2.9 percent in July. That's the lowest since 2021. The figure also lowers hurdles for a much-anticipated rate cut in September. Let's turn to Professor Kim se for more. Good morning. Good morning. So the latest CPI figure paves the way for a rate cut in September, doesn't it? That, that is true. Uh, in retrospect, U.S. annual inflation skyrocketed up to over 9% in 2022, but inflation uh, declined down to 2% level in July thanks to U.S. Fed's higher interest rate. So that means uh, that uh, most of the inflation pressure uh, disappeared and inflation came down to Federal Reserve uh, target uh, range. At the same time, since U.S. labor market is underperforming interest rate cut at atmosphere is perfect. It is almost 100% expected that U.S. Fed cuts its key interest rate in September's FOMC meeting. So interest being shifted from inflation to the labor sector you just mentioned, is it because inflation is now, now under full control or is it because the labor market is really bad or is it both? I think uh, both are reasons of monetary policy focus is shifting from inflation to labor market. Mm -hmm. in, in the last two years, inflation was high, but labor market uh, was pretty hot around the full employment in the United States. But U.S. economy situation became almost the opposite uh, between inflation and employment from early this year. Inflation became pretty much under control, but mm -hmm. employment uh, is not robust uh, compared to uh, before. Well, then tell us, what's it driving the poor labor market over in the States? Uh, the U.S. labor market in, for this year has shown, shown signs of continuous underperformance mm -hmm. uh, compared to previous years. For example, non-farm employment in July added uh, only 114,000 jobs, which is much less than expected and smaller than previous months. Uh, this can be attributed to several factors like Federal Reserve, uh, higher interest rate, economic uncertainty related to geopolitical issues like the war in Ukraine, and some, and some sectors, particularly technology, have experienced significant layoffs as companies adjust to post-pandemic uh, situation. Uh, these factors combined uh, have led to a labor market uh, while still adding jobs is doing so at a lower pace uh, than uh, before. Well, it looks like a rate cut in September is a, a given one for now. But the question is, how much of a rate cut is expected in September then? I mean, there are divided opinions. A quarter percentage point or uh, even a big rate cut, what do you think? Uh, previously, almost 100% of market's expectation was on a quarter percent cut in September's FOMC meeting. But as time goes by, uh, inflation is lower than expected and employment is also lower than expected. So a half percent interest rate cut in September uh, expectation gets stronger because it became more important to support labor market. But I believe that U.S. Fed is more likely to cut its key interest rate by a quarter percent in September mm. uh, because it is the first rate cut in, in, in two and a half years. Right. So U.S. Fed would be very cautious on the rate cut's impact on the economy. And if everything goes well without a major shock to economy after September's interest rate cut, U.S. Fed will uh, cut its rate by a half percent in November's FOMC meeting, depending on labor market situation. Right. We are still a month away from the uh, rate cut in September. It's expected one in September. Now, uh, before I let you go, Professor Kim, does that mean no rate cut yet for the Bank of Korea next week? 
Uh, actually, KDI, government think tank, is suggesting a preemptive interest rate cut in August, uh, which is next week. Uh, they argue that domestic consumption investments are weakening due to higher interest rate of the Bank of Korea. But I am pretty much sure that Bank of Korea will cut its rate. Uh, after seeing U.S. Federal Reserve interest rate cut in September, mm. uh, related to interest rate cut only in, in Korea, Bank of Korea believes that lower interest rate in Korea could trigger an unstable foreign exchange market by raising $1 exchange rate. The size of uh, Bank of Korea's interest rate cut in September would be a quarter percent. Which means uh, a possible rate cut in October for South Korea. All right, Professor Game, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me today. Despite it already being mid-August, when summer heat normally cools down here in the country, South Korea continues to suffer from a record-breaking heat wave. Our Lee Soo-jin tells us more. South Korea is battling one of its longest heat waves, with Seoul expected to soon surpass the current record for the longest period of consecutive tropical nights. According to the Korean Meteorological Administration, Seoul has endured a total of 26 back-to-back -back tropical nights as of Friday, matching the record for the longest stretch of tropical nights in Seoul's history, which was set in 2018 when South Korea went through one of its worst heat waves. A tropical night is when temperatures stay at a minimum of 25 degrees Celsius between 6 p.m. and 9 a.m. the next day. As the minimum temperature in Seoul is expected to remain above 25 degrees Celsius throughout this weekend, the record for the longest streak is likely to be broken. This comes one day after the KMA announced on Thursday that Busan, a poor city in the southeastern tip of Korea, saw tropical nights for 21 days in a row, matching the record seen in 1994 and 2018. And as of Friday, with 22 consecutive tropical nights, Busan has now officially recorded its longest ever streak of tropical nights. The KMA on Friday forecasts that the maximum temperature will feel as high as 35 degrees Celsius in most parts of the country, and the tropical nights are particularly likely in the western regions and along the southeast coast. The persistent sweltering conditions are rather unusual because the summer heat in South Korea typically tends to wane after mid-August. One meteorologist from the weather agency said that the humid air from the North Pacific's strong high-pressure system combined with high daytime temperatures have prevented temperatures from dropping even during the night, leading to sustained tropical nights. While rain is in the forecast for next week, the heat wave is expected to continue and the KMA says the intense heat of tropical nights could continue until the end of this month. Lee Soo-jin, Arirang News. Good morning, I'm Kim ji and this is The World Now. Sweden confirmed its first case of a more contagious and dangerous variant of the viral infectious disease Mpox, or formerly known as monkeypox, outside of Africa on Thursday, a day after the WHO declared the disease a global public health emergency for the second time in two years. Sweden's health and social affairs minister confirmed one case of the more grave type of Mpox called Clade 1, while the director general of the country's public health agency said the person was infected while staying in a part of Africa where there is a large outbreak of the disease. WHO director general Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus declared the upsurge of Mpox in the Democratic Republic of Congo and neighboring African countries a public health emergency of international concern under the international health regulations on Wednesday. Now, Tedros said that the emergence of a new variant, Clade 1B, which is predominantly sexually transmitted, is very worrying and that a coordinated international response is required. Mpox casualties in the DRC have significantly increased this year, already exceeding last year's tally with more than 15,600 cases and 537 deaths reported so far. Several outbreaks of different clades of Mpox in African countries are making measuring the spread of the infectious disease difficult. The WHO has released 1.45 million US dollars from its contingency fund 
but said $15 million are required for the initial response. Thailand's governing coalition, the Pu Thai Party, on Thursday named Petong Tan Sinawatra, the daughter of billionaire ex-PM Thaksin Sinawatra, as its candidate to become the new Prime Minister on Thursday, a day after the Constitutional Court sacked Sreta Tavisin from the position. Thai lawmakers will vote on Friday on whether to approve Petong Tan as the new Prime Minister. Now, 37-year-old Petong Tan, the current leader of the Putai Party, began a political career in 2022 and in 2023 was officially nominated as one of the party's three Prime Minister candidates. She's the youngest daughter of political heavyweight Thaksin Sinawatra and a niece of Ingluck Sinawatra, themselves both former Prime Ministers. If successful, Petong Tan will become the country's second female Prime Minister. Five people, including two doctors, were charged in Los Angeles on Thursday in connection to last year's drug-related death of Friends actor Matthew Perry. The five defendants, including Perry's personal assistant and a woman known in L.A. as the Ketamine Queen, have been charged with providing the Friends star with large quantities of the powerful sedative ketamine. In this case, U.S. Attorney Martin Estrada said that the defendants were part of a broad underground criminal network that distributed the drug to a high-profile client, while a DEA administrator claimed that each defendant took part in falsely prescribing, selling or injecting ketamine to Matthew Perry. Police have arrested two people so far, 42-year-old Dr. Salvador Plasencia, based in Santa Monica, and 41-year-old Yasvin Sangha, based in North Hollywood. Actor Matthew Perry died at age 54 from acute effects of ketamine, drowning in his hot tub after losing consciousness from the drug last October. Catalan police arrested three people on Wednesday and detained a fourth suspect on Thursday after the father of 17-year-old Spanish football star Lamin Yamal was stabbed multiple times in the northeastern Spanish town of Mataró late on Wednesday. According to Spanish national broadcaster TVE, Munir Nazraoui was taken to a hospital in Barcelona and is in a serious but stable condition. He was reportedly attacked by a group of people he had spoken to earlier in the day, close to the area where Yamal grew up. Yamal is Spain's youngest ever national team player and won the Euros this year, where he was also named Young Player of the Tournament. Good morning. Seoul and Busan walk up to the longest run of consecutive tropical nights since modern weather observation began back in 1907. As for Seoul, it has been 26 nights in a row. Actually, it equals the record set in 2018, but a new record is likely with heat showing no sign of easing up in the capital area. And we are looking at a chance of sudden downpours today. Well, Jeju Island will see rain of up to 80 millimeters into Saturday. And those near the water for a summer getaway need to beware of passing showers during the day. Skies will be sunny until that showers pass by. And Seoul and Daejeon should be getting up to 34 degrees Celsius, Jeju topping out at 32 degrees this afternoon. The extreme heat wave refuses to let up anytime soon, even at night, despite heading into mid-August. Searing heat during the day and restless nights are both physically and mentally uncomfortable. So take it easy and take good care of yourself. We've got a few more weeks to endure. That's Korea for you and here's a look at the international weather conditions.
We thank you for watching New Day at Arirang. Arirang News will be back at noon Korea time.